I think what I've done as my career has progressed is actually I'm much more comfortable at downplaying the ego and the emphasis and saying, all right, well, you've got to be have an awareness of all constituent parts for it to be effective. And I think you start about what it takes to win. The first part of that is to just drop everything, drop the ego, drop the professional bias, drop the experience. And almost start with the blank page of saying, okay, well, let's understand what success is. You know, really strip it back. And then we do, you know, we go down this whole process of reverse engineering, which is very cliche. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's about looking at all the constituent parts. Now, I always talk about, you know, the investment and the return of investment. And that's to me, is high performance and success. It's about maximizing the return on the investment and the investment is targeted to the specific things that influence outcome. Hello and welcome. I'm Eric Corum and you're listening to the Blueprint Podcast, where we explore the journey of high performance by learning from the struggles and triumphs of some of the most interesting people in the world. Dr. Duncan French is a world-class high-performance practitioner who's worked in the English Premier League, Olympic sport in the UK, and for the University of Notre Dame. He currently serves as the Vice President of Performance for the UFC Performance Institute. In this episode, Dr. French discusses what it really takes to win. He breaks down what high performance is and the common mistakes organizations make in trying to achieve it. He also talks about how he manages his own performance in a very demanding role with one of the world's top sports organizations. If you find today's podcast be valuable, go to www.ericcorum.com and sign up for my high performance newsletter. In this newsletter, I provide you with valuable resources and information to help you pursue audacious goals, thrive in uncertainty, and live a healthy and fulfilled life. But now it's time to lean in and learn from the best. All right. Well, Duncan, I'm really excited to have you on today. This is a treat for me. I hope it is for everybody else. No problem. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Absolutely. You know, I've known you for several years. And then when I started looking into your background, like I became more impressed. And uh, it's like, you know, you've worked in the EPL, Institute of Sport, Notre Dame, and now you're the vice president of performance at the UFC. And you have like a massive amount of experience working with elite athletes, like all over the world, right? What do you find to be the commonalities amongst these elite performers? Yeah, wow. Let's go straight into the deep end, eh, Eric. <laughs> Challenge me with that opener. Holy crap. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that's that's what we're all trying to understand and we're all trying to pursue, right? And I think in, in my experiences, I mean, last time I counted, I'd worked with 33 different, uh, 34, um, you know, different pro or Olympic sports, you know. So, yeah, I've been blessed by you know, a variety of experience across my career, which has been, you know, hugely informative and, and educational on, on how, you know, people go about success. And I think, you know, the the simple traits, you know, always seem to be the ones that differentiate at the highest level. Of course, you've got to have talent. Do you know what I mean? You've got to, you know, whatever the sport or whatever the business you work in, you have to be talented. You know, you've got to be innovative. You've got to be a, a you know, a creative, you know, find creative solutions to specific problems. But I think, you know, I don't want to make it too redundant or remedial, but certainly the fundamental things in my experience are the desire to, you know, to commit to the long course, the desire to strive towards a goal, to set goals and to, you know, to work towards that particular goal and the pathway is is critical. But within that, you know, goal setting process, it's also about the adherence to the day-to-day, you know, and mm. particularly, particularly what's, you know, here at the UFC with, you know, MMA fighters, which I would suggest is, you know, one of the most challenging sports in, in the world. These guys get up every day and commit to the regimen. You know, they commit to being in it and living it and breathing it. And, you know, there's no days off, right? And I think it's, it's a fundamental trait where it's compliance and it's adherence to, you know, the day-to-day. They've got to pick, you know, they've got to find small wins in all of that. You know, they've got to, you know, challenge themselves. But I think the best people commit to the day to day and are super diligent and they try and win the day. I and mean, I think that, you know, that's a, something we can probably take into all walks of life in terms of, you know, it's not always going to be 
you know, the best day and it's you know, certainly going to have sucky days. And um, these guys just, you know, the, the best athletes that I've been around just continue to adhere to, you know, to comply to the training load, to, to apply themselves to the performance lifestyle. And that's, that's kind of a long-term approach. It's interesting. You say like they set these goals and then they, they get to it and they, they you know, they, they adhere to the day to day. What is it like that's below the goal though? I mean, cause everybody's driven by something different. How do you guys, you know, setting a goal is one thing, but then like saying, okay, I'm doing this because of this, you know what I'm saying? Cause when you get up in the morning and you don't feel like doing it, like, what do you find? Is there a process that you guys go through to help them find that? Or is that just something that they have to intrinsically find themselves? Well, I think intrinsic motivation is, um, is important, but, you know, I also, I, I don't think that every world-class athlete is intrinsically motivated. So, you know, there's a lot of athletes that are extrinsically motivated. Right. And, and that's what's amazing about human beings, right, is we've got to figure out how we press the buttons, for want of a better term, you know, and emphasize that. You know, there's nothing wrong with being an extrovert and wanting external efficacy from people observing or recognition or whatever. Like, if that's what it requires, then we've got to figure out how we do that. There's obviously the other end of that spectrum where people are massively internally driven and it doesn't matter, you know, what the circumstances outside of their own world and their bubble they will continue to, you know, to, to forge ahead. So I think what we've got to do as coaches or as professionals is try to understand human behaviors rather than shy away from saying, oh, someone's a complete extrovert. As long as it's, if it's in a team setting and it's, you know, it's disruptive to the bigger strategy, I think it needs addressing. But at the same time, we've got to find things that we can lean upon to create motivation, to create direction, to create energy, and to create continued progress and development. And sometimes that's going to be an external trigger. Sometimes we, we, we try and embed internal triggers through core values and, and looking at what in, intrinsically is driving people and how we align to that. I steal some information from my good friend, Jeremy Shepard, you know, who talks about when your values match your behaviors, that mm-hmm. is what drives success. And I think, you know, that, that, that really resonates with me is, you know, personal values being aligned to the, the actions and your behaviors on a day-to-day basis. You know, if, if you're aligning those two things, it's pretty hard to steer away from defining your day and on an acute phase as, as kind of being successful, but also setting you up for long-term success, you know, efficacy against your values, and then making sure that your activities, your behaviors, your actions are aligned to meet those. I love it. You know, something that I saw was pretty interesting. So you have this desire to understand what it takes to win. Now, that's like, that's a huge desire, uh, especially in sport, but in life in general. Like, so how do you go about understanding or determining what it takes to win? That's in one of the 35 sports that you've worked with. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, in particularly in the role I'm in right now, in terms of it being the VP of performance here at the Performance Institute, you know, my, my role is to, is to have that umbrella awareness of all the respective facets that go into influence of success. And I think it's really fascinating because, you know, when I've come through my career as a, you know, as a strength coach or as a sports scientist or, you know, in, in different roles, you become very your optic is within the world that you live, right? So as a strength coach, everything that I'm looking at and my domain is, is the right way to go about things. If I'm, you know, a sports scientist, I'm looking at a particular thing and you become very tunnel vision, you become very kind of discipline centric in what, in what you're trying to achieve. I think what I've done as my career has progressed is actually I'm much more comfortable at downplaying the ego and the emphasis and saying, all right, well, You've got to be have an awareness of all constituent parts for it to be effective. And I think if you start about what it takes to win, the first part of that is to just drop everything, drop the ego, drop the professional bias, drop the experience, and almost you know, almost start with the blank page of saying, okay, well, let's understand what success is. You know, really strip it back. And then we do, you know, we, we, we go down this whole process of reverse engineering, which is very cliche. But, you know, at the end of the day, 
It's about looking at all the constituent parts. Now, I always talk about, you know, the investment and the return of investment. That to me is high performance and success. It's about maximizing the return on the investment and the investment is targeted to the specific things that influence outcome. Now, that outcome, you know, just taking something arbitrary, might be very, very small. It might be someone's daily routine. It might be someone's interpretation of an exercise versus a different exercise. You know, it's, it can be something very rudimental. At the same time, it can be something pretty pretty gross and vast in terms of, you know, workload as a, as a paradigm, like how much volume of work are we doing? Now, that's a pretty big conversation. It might be a, you know, a periodization conversation. So I think what, when I talk about what it takes to win, it's about getting into the granular levels of understanding the different component parts that influence outcome and making sure the work that you put against those respective component parts is maximizing its efficiency or its transfer to make a, an impact on the uh, on the, the desired success. Of it. Man, this is hard. And I remember coming to meet you soon after you took the job. I think it was in a short period of time and I was in your office and you had this like decision tree wrapped around your entire room. Right. And it was like the beginning, I think, Later on, when I saw that document that you made forward facing, I'm assuming that was kind of the beginning or part of that process where it was like, if this, then that, then this, then this, you know, I believe, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like, there are ways to do this low tech, like really low in in any organization, there's things that you can solve, but at some point does like these new tools that we have, like machine learning really come into play to help you parse out all the components of travel and stress and eating and weights and you see what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. And you make a, a really valid point. Actually, it's got to start with the low tech, you know, and I would say that that's, that's absolutely the first place you need to go. So don't be put off by the perception of what it takes to understand all the intricacies. At the end of the day, the best conversation to begin with is with the athlete themselves. Like what, what do you feel that you do and your behaviors and your practices and your mindset that you think influences the outcome of your success? You know, speak to the coach, do the same thing. You know, to begin with, it's, it's very low tech and make sure you, you're canvassing the right information. Of course, what, you know, what I'm a huge believer in with, with my background is, is some objectivity. All right. So wherever possible, and again, that can be at different levels, but we need to try and bring objectivity into the conversation. So whether it's competition data, whether it's historical performance metrics where you can track across time or retroactively look at results or things like that, you know, you're just capturing and gathering information that's going to give you more insight, or more to be better informed to make decisions about how we're going to progress and move forward. And, and at the end of the day, that's what this whole thing is. It's about decision making, right? But I think... Mm. I always believe, yeah, start with the low tech, start with the basics, because I think in sports science and sports performance, the world of sports performance that we live in right now, we're overwhelmed with technology. And often the the go-to for a lot of people is, all right, well, we're going to create competitive advantage by buying into a technology or using a data analytic method that is no one else in the league is doing it. Now, yeah, there's there's a time and a place where that's going to become super valuable, whether it's AI or predictive analytics or whatever it may be. But I think, you know, that, that's the beauty of sport is it's still pretty nuanced. And if you start with the nuance and then build objectivity on top of that to confirm, validate or reject what that anecdotal interpretation is, you set yourself up for a, a good process then. And I think that's what we try to do. I love it. You're, you're, you're speaking my love language with this whole data piece because the company that I have now, you know, we have this statement that data is useless, you know, unless you know what to do with it. And I think, you know, you and I came up in a time where like, you know, this stuff was just emerging and yes, it solved problems at the time, because if you didn't quantify it, it was just an argument between two people. And one person's like, I'm right, you're wrong. And you're like, well, blah, blah. but then you have some objectivity and you go, no, no, really you drove a hundred miles in your car. Right. Now, it's not like you or me, like this is just what it is. And now let's figure out a way to go about it. But so many people, so many massive companies have tried to solve problems with tech. 
and failed because I don't think they've had the mental model for it, for the actual problem. Yeah. And, and that comes back to, again, my, my, you know, I talk about the scientific process, right? The, the scientific process is about defining the question first. You know, what is your hypothesis? Well, what's the question trying to answer? What's the hypothesis? What do you think against that question? So if you look at that on a sports performance perspective, that hypothesis is kind of like coach experience or coaching eye or, you know, I'm trying to make this guy faster. And I think the best way to do it is change his, change his knee lift or look at his foot contact. Do you know what I mean? So that, that's that hypothesis in an applied setting is almost the anecdotal coaching perspective. Mm-hmm. Now, what we do in, in, a, in a scientific methodology is we obviously progress that into an, in, an investigation or an intervention, but with the desire to create conclusions, like understanding. And the, the conclusion is the decision, and the decision only comes from the data collected and the information collected in that intervention. So I think it's kind of a rudimental like analogy I give you, but that's the way I see it because my background or my mind thinks as a scientific process from start to finish in terms of the data, it has to give us a conclusion to then make an informed decision about how we go left or right. Mm-hmm. Sometimes in sports performance, we get, you know, with, with coach being king and all this type of conversation, we get stuck at the the anecdotes and the coach's eye, which is still hypothetical and it hasn't progressed the scientific methodology in its complete cycle of, of, of completion, you know? Hmm. Let me ask, I want to go back for just a second because you got my mind thinking about, you know, you said dropping the ego and understanding all the different parts and having a more global view. As somebody that oversees all these things, hmm. how do you help people in their silos understand the global view? Like, is that important to you to help everybody zoom back a little bit? How, how have you gone about that? Again, for me, it's it's critical, and I'm I'm a huge believer of my background, my experiences. You know, largely influenced by you know the British Olympic model that that I've been experienced for 14 years of my career, has, has massively influenced my thought process in this area. But yeah, for me, I look at it as the machine, right? The the, the machine of athletic performance, and every cog, every service, every individual, every technical discipline is a cog within the whole machine. Those cogs all interact, and if one cog isn't turning correctly, the whole machine comes to a standstill, right? So I think, you know, we don't just want cogs spinning on their own in space. The cogs have to drive another cog, which drives another cog, which drives another cog, you know, and that's the machine. So I'm a huge believer in the removal of silos and and an integrated interdisciplinary approach. Now, that starts with psychological security, right? Mm. And, and, you know, the staff and the, the... the individuals have to be comfortable. You know, I say drop your egos, like let's strip it back. Well, we're all, we all come with professional bias and professional experiences that we want to retain. That's our identity. I'm the director of physical therapy. I'm the director of strength and conditioning. Like there are identities for people. So we talk a lot about like, you know, not talk about it, but I, in my role, I try to give, you know, security to people and understanding that we can challenge each other. And it's going to be beneficial. It's not going to be a negative process that you can let down your barriers and bring people into your world to interrogate or question or analyze what you're doing. And actually, the purpose of that is to promote integration and decision making and conversation rather than to say you're doing something wrong or incorrectly. And I think, you know, as a principle, what we're all looking for as employees and and staff members is the comfort to make mistakes and the comfort to play, to innovate, to, to do things differently, to see if it's successful or not. That, that to me, is part of the high-performance process. Mm. Certainly, my role, I see my role is to facilitate these interactions. Now, they might be subconscious interactions. They might be conscious interactions where we're actually driving initiatives together. But I think by the way we set up our facility, by the way we set up our processes and our operations, by the messaging that we deliver, by the expectations of our meeting, information they want to share. It also drives subconscious interactions that are going to promote interdisciplinary conversation. Mm. Now, you have to interact with some very interesting people, mm. athletes from all over the world that we, you know, watch go into the octagon and do some really difficult things. You know, I started 
getting into combat sports a few years ago and in my aperture and the whole situation changed completely. You know, you have some unique experiences as a child that may have set you up for this. You want to talk about your acting career a little bit? <laughs> yeah, man. No, I mean, listen, how cool is my job, right? I, I think there's 47 different languages in the in the UFC. Last time I stood, you know, there, there's you know, a large amount of countries and territories represented. It's it's a fascinating melting pot of, of culture and of, of behaviors and characteristics. So, you know, what we try to do is obviously optimize and align our services to maximize potential. And it comes back to your very first question. How do you drive high performance, right? The, the culture of an Asian fighter and how we set up our services has to be different to the culture of a Russian or a European or an American fighter. It just has to be. So that, that creates a really interesting dynamic that we have to constantly flex and pivot. Um, I mean, I always... I try not to celebrate it, you know, too much or make notice of it. But yeah, when I was a kid, I was I was pretty high energy, let's say. Um, and my parents tried to channel a lot of that energy, and they sent me to kind of drama school or acting classes on a on a weekend, on a morning, on a Saturday morning. And then, you now one thing which I really excelled at was like character acting. So, you know, when I was you know from the ages of like ten to sixteen, seventeen, I was doing a lot of acting. And I draw upon that kind of experience or that kind of skill today in my coaching um, and in, in my day-to-day role because it's about wearing different hats. It's about being able to flex your style to meet the needs of your um, your client or your counterpart or your colleague. Um, and Dale Carnegie obviously wrote about this back in the day and how to win friends and influence people. But I really looked to my ability, and I'm not a trained actor, like a classically trained actor. I just went to a drama group on a Saturday morning. That's not what you said. You said you were like <laughs> in all these big films and all this kind of, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I've done TV shows and, and radio commercials and things back in the day. And, it, you know, just mm. being able to wear a different personality, a different persona, that allows me hopefully to be a better communicator with executives or front office or with athletes, with coaches, with my immediate colleagues and peers in technical areas, with the media, with people, Joe Blow on the street, you know, it, it's, we're, we're constantly having to pivot. And if there's only one, one approach, that one approach might meet the needs of a particular interaction, but it certainly won't meet the needs of a different um, interaction. So I think that's something which I just draw upon. And, and reference today in my, uh, my my career as, you know, I think it was beneficial to learn how to wear different personas and different personalities. I love it. I think that's so critical to being able to lead a diverse group of people or just to interact with other folks is to, is to be able to, in some ways, kind of, I'm not going to say become a chameleon, but, you know, like, 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 Likes like, you know what I'm saying? Like chooses like. Yeah, uh, if yeah. you look at like selection processes, people like to choose people like themselves. And so if you're trying to connect with somebody across the pond or somewhere else, it's like a little bit different. I think that acting background is so awesome. That was a really unique thing that I learned about you. One thing we haven't defined is what is high performance to you? Yeah, I mean, like I say, for me, for me personally or for me in, in the professional field, both. Like, what does it mean professionally? And what does high performance mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we've, we've touched on it already. Like I say, for, for me, performance, you know, high performance as a paradigm has got affinity to everything we do in our lives, whether it's professional or personal. And, you know, I hold my hands up and been very transparent. There's times when my career performance has been fantastic and my personal performance has suffered. And that still continues, you know, every now and again, day to day here, you know, the, the stresses and expectations that I'm supposed to deliver on a corporate level. And then, you know, what stuff, the bank, you know, the balance is, is what we're talking about, you know, what, 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 what overwhelms, you know, the different parts and different facets of your life. So from that, like I say, I've already touched on it, you know, for me, it's about investment and return on investment. So that comes to, you know, day to day health and wellness and well-being. You know, if I invest time to eat well, eat healthy, sleep, go to the gym, go to, you know, jujitsu and practice and be around, you know, a social environment as human beings, you know, that's going to, the return on that investment is going to be beneficial to me. But if I neglect that, that investment, you know, there's going to be no return. So if I'm not taking the time to figure out 
the most appropriate schedule where I can make it to the gym or I can eat healthy or I avoid high fatty foods. It, it, it's not going to, it's not going to give me the output. It's not going to give me the return on investment because I'm simply not engaging with it. Same thing in my career. You know, if, if I dedicate you know time and it's effective and it's targeted and it's efficiently delivered, you know, hopefully the outcomes are successful. So for me, you know, th- there's, there's lots of things that go into high performance, but at the end of the day, it's about, are you touching on the things that are crucial and critical or do you get lost in the white noise? I think you've got to be able to filter the respective constituent parts that are really going to be impactful on the outcome. That may be career or health or personal or relationship or family orientated. And then like I've, I've touched on, you know, I've, done, I've spoken to Jeremy a lot on this previously, but, you know, the personal values have to come into this conversation of high performance. If, we, if we're moving it just for, well, not necessarily, because we do a lot of work on personal values amongst our team here and any team that I kind of, I'm, I'm a leader of, I always try to have the discussion around what are our individual personal values and what are the values of our organization and how are they aligned or not. But I think, you know, it's impossible to talk about high performance on a personal level without understanding your values, what makes you you, and then seeing how close or disparate from those values you're becoming. No, I love that. I mean, one thing I try to do is anchor my actions on my values. Right. So like if I have to take an action and it's difficult, if I can think about linking that action to what I value, then I'm more likely to persist in difficult times. For you, somebody that like the cognitive load on you is enormous. I mean, you author books, you are dealing with one of the, I mean, a huge organization. Like what are the couple things that like you have, like, you know, that if I don't do this, I'm not at my best. Is, yep. is it sleep for you? Is it like exercise? Is there like just like a couple of things you're like, I have to do this or I'm miserable? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really great question because I, I know exactly when I'm, I'm miserable or I know when I'm overwhelmed or I'm burnt out, you know? For me, I'm a very social animal. So if I don't have social interaction, you know, that, that pushes me down, you know? Mm-hmm. And I always say to my, my, my team, like, listen, if you're passing, just stick your head in my office and say hello. Like that, I need that right? You're not bothering me. I might be in the middle of something, but I need that, you know? And I think, you know, they're, they're aware that, you know, I'm, I want to interact. I want to converse. I want to be around and I want to laugh and joke and move away, you know, from some of the day-to-day business conversations and just be a, you know, a sociable animal. So, you know, I think when I'm overwhelmed with work or, you know, when I'm writing textbooks or editing chapters or whatever it would be, you know, that, that suppresses your social interaction because I'm sat in front of this computer and it becomes very transactional with an electronic device. And I think that's something which I'm really aware of. Um, I think I need, and again, I say this very openly and transparently, I, I need some external um, validation. You know, I, I do to feel like I've got worth and I'm of value. So I have to somehow, and that, that's not me, I guess it goes back to me being an actor and wanting to show off and, 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 you know, get people's reaction. I think even in my career now, like it's, it, it really motivates me when I get some, some sort of validation externally. Now that might be, you know, from my team, it might be from my athletes. It might be, all right, I'm trying to write, you know, a, a book or a chapter and, and people are going to read this, you know, that that's something which I've also notified, noticed that I need. And again, I'm not trying to do that because I'm a, you know, I'm just expect all the limelight on me or the, the bright lights. But however I do it, I've got to constantly think, all right, what, what's going to be my interpretation of this? How will it give me some validation? And who's going to see it? And who's going to notice it? Or who's going to make a remark or a comment? That's all I need, which is, you know, I'm, I'm not sure a lot of people would admit to that type of scenario, but I think I've learned to say that that's, but I need that, you know, and I need it. So alongside the social piece, I need to figure out some kind of a little bit of validation along the way because that's my motivation because my intrinsic motivation, whilst it's I've got pretty clear values of what I hold dear and true, at the same time, if we look at the spectrum of external versus internal motivation, I sit above average to the external requirements. So, you know, I've, I've got to try and align my life to do that. Maybe a tough question, maybe not. Then how do you find peace? Tough for me, tough. And again, mm. I'm like, I'm opening up my heart here, right? I, I, my mind doesn't settle, so I have to 
proactively understand how I'm going to dial down the noise and dial down the volume to give myself the chance to recharge and regenerate. Now, for me, that might be you know, time away from, from just the day-to-day work and, and the, the volume. It might be time alone. You know, I, I enjoy being by the beach or you know, being by the ocean. That's kind of my happy place. So I have to make sure I have to get that fix every now and again. So yeah, I have to consciously do that, Eric, because yes, the noise or the self-chatter is something which I constantly have to address. You and I are very similar. Right. <laughs> I heard Elon Musk recently. No way am I a Musk or whatever, you know, the <laughs> richest man in the world. He's next level genius. Right. But he said something to the effect of like, you don't want to be me. Because there's, it's like he's, he was like explosions going off in his head all the time. Now, I don't have that type of like the next billion dollar idea is always hitting me every 10 minutes and I got to think I got to go create it. But I can understand and I understand this idea of like just stuff is just going on. And it's not necessarily bad. It's just these conversations and this curiosity and this, I got to do this next thing. Or it's like, it's hard to shut it off. And that's why I have this big whiteboard over here and I just go write it down. Right. How have you learned to, I mean, you said like on a day to day, do you take time for yourself? Like 10 minutes to just quiet your mind or before you go to bed so you can get to sleep? Like how, what are your mechanisms to, to quiet that voice? Yeah. I mean, from a circadian rhythm perspective, I'm actually a real night owl. So, you know, I've looked a lot into kind of physiology of circadian rhythm and optimizing performance. And, you know, I'm best writing or working from kind of, you know, seven till 11 in the evening. Now that, that makes for, that makes for a tough day if, I, if I'm in for working out at 7am in the morning. But yeah, that's something that I've noticed. And so number one, I try and align my work to optimize that. But I've also got to balance that with family time, right? If that's an evening and, and my, my wife and kids expect me to be back from work, and I've got to dedicate my time to them, obviously. But yeah, that, that means that I look at my day and I can take, I can look at pauses in the day. And you know, I can look at when's the most appropriate time just to be comfortable knowing I'm going to go a little bit slower, or I'm just going to divert my interest and my attention to something a bit more casual for the next 20 to 30 minutes. That's been something which I've tried to do, knowing that actually, okay, in a few hours time, I might be ramping things up and I'm going to be super productive. And again, I talked to Joel Jameson a fair bit about um, you know circadian rhythms and optimizing behaviors and things. It's, it's pretty fascinating because we're all driven into this nine to five kind of life of corporate America but it's not, it's not, and, and, and particularly if you work in pro sports, and then it's extended beyond that. You, you, you yourself know full well from the time of the Houston, the, the, the uh, Texans. So, you know, it's an interesting dynamic when, when you optimize your own performance within a day and when your energy bank is high and when your energy bank is low. And yeah, the, that, that's the time when you kind of got to be self conscious and, and, and be selfish and give yourself the moment. Have you looked into ultradian rhythms at all? So you have a circadian 24-hour clock, and then you have what's called ultradian rhythm. So sleep happens in 90-minute cycles. Right. Well, there's also 90-minute cycles in your day. And so there's a lot of really convincing research around the fact that like, we work best in these 60 to 90-minute windows of focused effort with this dichotomous relationship of complete relaxation. Mm. And so that's how we can actually to improve neuroplasticity or to learn a skill or to really do deep work, like these 90 minute, really hard component of times and then complete like portrait mode. Like you completely zoom back. Don't look at any technology, almost like you're just taking in the world and there's some amazing stuff going on. And I've been t- going way down the rabbit hole on this and it's helped me be more productive during the day. I do my own 60 to 90 minute sprints. And then it's like, I go as hard as I can, and then I just completely unplug. Right. And then in this old trading rhythms are super fascinating. So you may want to take a, a little bit of a dive on that one as somebody that wants to. And yeah. then it makes me feel less anxious about not being productive all the time because you can't. Because productivity yeah. will fall. And so, you know, and it's also interesting like at the very beginning of these windows, you're not good. It takes a little bit of agitation and this noradrenaline to get up for you to kind of get into the zone, so to speak. 
and you shouldn't feel guilty about it. It's taking me a little bit to get into that, but that's the body's natural mechanism. And then it's like, boom, you're in it. So anyways. Yeah, that's you as you were saying that. I was like, okay, I was talking my language because it. I'm, I'm that guy. Like I need to, it takes me 30, 40 minutes to warm up, to be comfortable, to sit and say, all right, now it's go time. You no, know, I actually need to meander into being productive. I'm not yes. a guy that turns the switch on. It's like, right, I'm just going to turn on the computer and I'm going to go. I'm going to turn on the computer and I'm going to meander around some emails or some websites or some reading. And then it's like, okay, I've been here long enough. I've saturated some of the redundant stuff. Now I can get into my, my productive phase. So yeah, that really resonates with me because uh, again, I think it's you know, I'm self-reflecting. That's certainly something which I, uh, I wish I was more efficient at, let's say. Yeah. I've been learning about these neuromodulators and how they work in sequence with things like acetylcholine to help it's just super fascinating. And now I, I actually have less guilt. <laughs> now that I know this is how my body works, I'm like, okay, I can work with it and take advantage of it. But, um, you know, as somebody that's in such a senior role, vice president, I mean, that's a big role, and you're over a lot of things, who or what is investing in you or pouring into you to help you grow? Um, yeah, I mean, I think... You know, there's there's a huge amount. Well, let me rephrase this. Yeah, there's responsibility in um, in in what I in what I do here in my role. Um, of course, you know, the UFC is a multi billion dollar industry in itself. But I think you know this has been like such a a refreshing the refreshing role to take on. Like every day is a blessing here. Um, whether it's you know, the team that we've, we've been able to recruit, you know, which, you know, have become great friends as well as colleagues. You know, we're in the trenches together. They recognize my role. I recognize their role. But, you know, we, we are very open and, 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 you know, humble in our approach through to, okay, you know, the executive level of the UFC has got a huge amount of experience of building out what I would say is one of the most innovative kind of sports properties in the world. To be around that on a day-to-day basis, it's just hard not to be inspired by someone like Dana or our CEO and others because this company is 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 it's upstart. Yeah, it's a bit socially it, it, you know socially not accepted all everywhere, but it is becoming more and more accepted. But you know, as a entertainment industry, as a as a company that is like I say innovative, is always looking to push the boundaries. One of our you know one of our maxims is be first. You know, they're always looking to change the status quo, to be around that, to be part of that is, is hugely motivating and stimulating. And, and just to stand back sometimes and watch it happen. It's like, wow, this is, this is fascinating. Um, so that, that's really important for me. But then, you know, I, I proactively seek, I pro- proactively seek the counsel of others. I think that, you know, I've, I've been reading a lot about the loneliness of leadership recently, because I think it, the, the irony of leadership is that you never as you progress in your career, you, you don't really have the credentials to become a leader as you progress. Whereas experience, so you're always de-skilled for your next promotion, right? That's kind of the irony of this whole thing. And leadership can be kind of a, a, a tough, lonely world at times. And I think I've had to proactively seek colleagues and friends in different pro organizations that have got similar roles to mine, jumping into different you know leadership forums or performance director forums where I can feel very open in letting my kind of challenges or my personal you know, experiences and emotions come to the fore, knowing that I'm not going to be judged because the people that are going through what I'm going through, the people that are doing their job are probably going through the same thing as me. So if I have that conversation with others internally in my organization or my team, there might just be a misrepresentation or lack of clarity about actually the experiences of what you have to do in this type of position. So, you know, that's been hugely rewarding as well is, you know, just again, letting my guard down with, with colleagues and, and friends from other pro organizations that are not going to judge, understand where you're coming from. And then you can, you know, that, that, that active conversation about how, you know, how they've worked through things, how you know, they perceive my scenario, how they would work through my scenario, what I've done. And it's just really powerful conversation then. Now, I really appreciate the humility in that. That's so true. That is such a truism. I hope people really like, like maybe push pause and go back a minute and listen to this again. Cause like every time you go up into a new leadership level, it's so true. Like you're, you're not qualified for that. 
You are because somebody saw the potential, but you've never had that role. And so there is a bet that's being taken, that's taking place and they're betting on you winning. And, uh, and that's a, there can be some heaviness with that. And just, I really appreciate the humility in your response there. As somebody that is privy to probably the latest and greatest in everything, uh, and you're getting sold something every day, you know, <laughs> somebody's trying to get your email to yeah. pitch their greatest thing. What do you see down the line? Maybe not a specific product, but as like, what is going to be the next thing in human performance? Physical, psychological, you name it. Like, what do you think as we see all these amazing things happening with epigenetics and integrated technologies and microbiome and all this kind of stuff? What do you, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, that is, wow. That's, that's a, a month long podcast in itself, right? We'll just have to have you back. <laughs> but I think, yeah, a, a few things like thematically, I can give you what I, you know, what my experiences are yeah. thematically. So, I mean, I think, you know, I would call it training above the neck is what you've touched on, you know, everything from, um, you know, circadian rhythms to what did you call them? Ultradian rhythms. Ultradian rhythms, you know, but just in terms of the brain and, you know, the, what we know and what we understand about that from a everything from a recovery and regeneration perspective through to performance optimization perspective. So I think, you know, we, we, we actually understand physical training pretty well. Like, we, we, you know, there's years and years of research on that type of stuff. We, we, we actually don't move the needle too much in physical training, but the needle needs to move massively in terms of anything above the neck and brain orientated and how that then has a cascade into the rest of your physiology to produce peripheral adaptation based on a, a central kind of message. So I think in terms of what we're doing or what science and technology is doing in terms of you know, training the neck, training above the, brain, the neck, I call it, but you know, the, the optimization of mental and cognitive function, I think is, is, is really going to accelerate and needs to accelerate. So that's something I certainly think there's legs to. I struggle with the the genetic and the genome mapping and the epigenetics right now because for me as a as an applied practitioner it's okay and what kind of response right so if we map the genome of every single fighter and we find the the, the fighter genome like so what like what what's that going to do to me on a day-to-day basis with either recruitment or training program strategy et cetera et cetera so I struggle with that a little bit with the caveat of microbiome and meta- metabolomics, then yes, now we can potentially really dive down into some very specific initiatives and interventions for individuals. And I think that's where we can create, you know, performance optimization a little bit more because we're now tailoring interventions at the much, a much more accurate and intentional level. So you know, that, that's certainly something which I'm keeping my eye on. And we're, we're talking with different vendors and, and you know, organizations about that type of thing here at the UFC. And then obviously it's, it's the obvious response of smaller, faster, more efficient, you know, those types of things. You know, how, how, how long do battery lives last? How small is a sensor? How accurate is a sensor? How long does it last for, you know, the invisible technology world versus the wearable technology world? You know, what, what's it going to be? So they're just a few that I would say, you know, I, that's why I see it going. Awesome. I mean, this is coming from one of the best in the world. So it's, I always find it interesting to hear what people think the future is going to look like. Cause that's, that's how you win is being able to look around corners, especially in like business. Can you yeah. see the next thing coming before, before anybody else can, and you can get there faster and, and build it. But you know, Duncan, I really appreciate you spending time with us today. Like I, I started, I take notes while I do these things. And usually I'm looking for like one or two really big juicy bites to kind of put at the beginning of the podcast. And I think I have like 30. And so uh, I'm just going to have to listen to this again. But, um, you know, I really appreciate you spending some time with us. I know you're massively busy. And so for you to take some time out of your schedule was really just very kind of you. And I appreciate that. No, any Anytime, Eric. It's great to reconnect. And yeah, thanks for Thanks for giving me the platform just to share. Hopefully people see it's valuable and with, with your listeners in, in different um, business or sporting organizations. And um, I would say, listen, I just try and do what I do, you know, and, and 
we're all kind of trying to get ahead in the world. We're all trying to fumble, at, you know, fumble forwards. But yeah, I definitely have become more collective and cognizant of what my strengths and weaknesses are. I think as my career has developed, and I think there's there's value in in taking time just to be somewhat, you know, be reflective, but also not tear yourself down, but be critical of where you are less than optimal. And then also celebrate the wins, like celebrate what you're good at. And I think I've really found much more clarity in what I'm good at and where I can continue to target to improve myself. Love it. Thank you again, Duncan. I appreciate it. All right, man. No problem. Thanks for joining me today on another episode of the Blueprint Podcast. If you found this episode valuable, sign up for my high-performance newsletter at www.ericcorum.com. And if you want to stay current on everything high performance, follow me on Instagram at Eric Quorum, Twitter at Eric Quorum, Facebook, and I'm also on LinkedIn. 